The source of temperature here on Earth is that big burning ball of gas in the sky, the sun. Through its heat, we're able to live here, and it also causes the movement of air that creates that very interesting weather. How does it transfer this heat to us though, and how does it even cause that interesting weather? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the second class in the Meteorology series. In this class, we're going to be taking a look at the first of those interesting elements in the atmosphere, the temperature. Temperature variations and changes drive pressure variations and changes, which then lead to the movement of air throughout the atmosphere and the creation of weather systems. So it's going to be very important to understand how temperature works before we move on to the more interesting stuff of actual big weather systems. The temperature that will appear in any weather report or that is shown on your weather app will always be the surface temperature, which is measured in a shaded container and raised off the ground by a meter or so. This way there's not a huge variation based on the location of the weather station. Um, if it was placed on rocks, for example, they heat up really quickly compared to something like grass. This way a way more accurate reading is given and it will be in either Celsius, Fahrenheit or Kelvin. So you've got various temperature scales. I've just picked a few significant numbers here um, and you can see that at zero degrees Celsius, we've got 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 273 degrees Kelvin, which means that zero Kelvin is located at minus 273 or minus 459 Fahrenheit. 100 degrees Fahrenheit is 38 degrees Celsius or 311 Kelvin. This is the conversion from uh, Celsius into Fahrenheit and this is the conversion from Celsius into Kelvin. Fahrenheit 1.8 times the Celsius plus 32. Kelvin is Celsius plus 273. The sun heats up the Earth's surface and then the heat from the surface of the Earth is used to heat up the atmosphere. So as we increase in altitude and get further from the surface, the temperature falls until reaching the tropic pause. In the troposphere, temperature falls with altitude. At this point, the ozone kicks in in the upper atmosphere and absorbs some of the heat from the sun and then heats up the surrounding air and that's what is happening in the stratosphere. The amount that the sun heats up the surface is dependent on a couple of factors, the first of which is called insulation. This is a term used to describe how much energy is absorbed by the Earth's surface per unit area. In the drawing here, you can see that the same column of sun rays has to spread out over a larger area at the higher latitudes because it's got to go a bit further. You can see this is the rough sort of shape that it's going to hit, whereas this column here is a smaller circle. So at the equator, there are more rays per unit area and therefore the heat energy transfer is much greater at the equator when compared to the poles. Due to the tilt of the Earth as well, in June in the Northern Hemisphere, we're going to be slightly closer to the Sun, meaning that more energy is transferred. And in December in the Northern Hemisphere, the Sun, uh, the tilt will be slightly further away from the Sun, so we'll have less energy transferred. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's obviously going to be the opposite, which means it's going to be hot in the summer and cold in the winter. So as the sun rays transfer heat energy to the Earth's surface, different materials warm up easier than others. Think about how hot the sand on a beach gets in summer compared to the grass. So first of all, we've got water. It doesn't really absorb that much heat energy. That's because much of the heat energy received is reflected and it's also used in the evaporation of the surface water. Water also requires a lot of energy to raise the temperature even by a small amount. If you think about how long it takes water to boil um, when you're cooking, for example. This means that the temperature of water doesn't rise as quickly as the land. If the land was to be covered in snow, then much of the energy is just reflected in the same way as it is with the surface of the water. A small amount of energy would also be used to melt and evaporate the snow um, a similar sort of thing would happen with clouds as well. If we had clouds up here, they would bounce off in the same way as it does with snow. If we're looking at trees and vegetation in general, they will absorb a lot of heat energy because they use it to grow and create food through photosynthesis. So forests and trees and vegetation in general will heat up quite well. 
if you think about sand and rocks, they're even better than trees. They just are very tightly packed together and they heat up really quickly and then radiate out the heat. And then uh, evolution of that would be cities built out of bricks and steel and you know man-made materials because they absorb the heat and then radiate it out and it reflects and bounces back off of the side walls and it bounces around the city and just makes it nice and toasty. So after the sun has finished heating up the surface, the surface then heats up the air above it. The first way it does this is known as conduction. This is heat through contact. This is basically where the air directly above the surface is heated. And it's only a very shallow layer. When the air is heated up, it expands. And that means the density decreases. You see that uh, density is given the symbol rho equals the mass over the volume. If we increase the volume, then the density will decrease and less dense things rise. This process is known as convection. So the less dense air rises up and it dissipates that heat out into the surrounding air. If there's a little bit of wind, this air can also be moved sideways and all around and it basically causes a mixing motion which we call turbulence heating. As the air rises, it will eventually cool down and start to condense and form clouds. When it condenses, it actually releases energy. It gives off heat energy, which we call latent heat. And if we were to have a big weather system moving through, big uh, wind coming through from um, somewhere hotter than we are currently in, we'd call that advection heating. It's different to turbulence heating because turbulence heating is just the mixing of the air that's already a um, above where we are, whereas advection would be warm air coming in and that warm air heating up where we are. So if you think about it, if there's a strong wind from uh, North Africa up into Europe, that warmer air will come in and heat up Europe. That's advection heating. Finally, we have radiation heating. So the sun's ray come in and a very short wave radiation, very high energy radiation. And then the surface will admit out long wave radiation. Long wave radiation is lower in energy and therefore colder than the sun rays. Um, and then this long wave radiation is absorbed by the air molecules and it heats up the atmosphere around it. The diurnal variation is a fancy way of saying it gets cold at night, basically. So as the sun's rays are lost, the surface temperature falls. Um, but the type of material on the surface will greatly influence how much the temperature falls. Things that are good at absorbing and heating up will get colder at night and hotter during the day. Um, water doesn't vary very much, whereas built up areas will get very hot during the day and then also very cold at night. The temperature will reach its highest point, not when the sun is highest in the sky at 12 o'clock, but slightly after as the surface will absorb and then release that energy through convection heating, through radiation heating and all the other types that we saw before, so that the air is hottest at about two o'clock local time in still air conditions. If there is wind and turbulence heating occurs, then the cooler air higher up is mixed with the lower air further down during the day. Then at night, this kind of mixed air is still present and the lack of incoming sun rays has less an effect on the temperature variation. So when it's a windy day, there's much less of a variation uh, in temperature from day to night when compared to a still day. Clouds can also affect the variation of temperature throughout the day. If it's cloudy at midday, then some of the sun's rays are kind of reflected off and not as many reach the surface, which means that there's less of a heating process of the surface and much less heat is radiated out. And if at night the clouds are still present, it has the effect of reflecting back all of the surface radiation back down to the surface. And that insulates um, the earth. It kind of acts like a jacket around the area that you're in. The heat bounces off and comes back in. So this is why desert areas with clear skies are known for being really hot during the day then really cold at night. It's partly due to that lack of clouds reflecting off air during the day and reflecting back in um, radiation heat at night.
Normally in the troposphere, the temperature drops by about 1.98 degrees per thousand feet or two degrees per thousand feet. Occasionally though, inversions will occur. This is where instead of reducing, the temperature actually increases or if it remains constant, it's known as an isothermal layer. So there's a few different types. We get something known as a ground inversion. This occurs during calm, low wind, cold nights. And what happens is the surface temperature drops significantly and the surface cools um, the air around it by conduction. This makes the air more dense and it doesn't rise to the air above. So it's not cooled as much. That means that the air above is higher in temperature. Due to the lack of wind, there's no turbulence mixing um, this cold air around. And this means that the cold air just sits at the ground. And um, this ground inversion usually results in a bit of low cloud or sometimes fog. You also get something called a subsidence inversion, which is formed when air descends due to winds or something forcing it down like a mountain. It then starts to warm up as it descends down. This warm air then falls on top of surface air. This surface air can't get pushed out of the way because it's got the ground in its way. So the warmer air just sends up resting on top of the colder air. Um, a similar thing can happen with frontal inversions. This is kind of the same. You get a hot, um, a warm air system moving in and it is forced above the cold air and the cold air is then trapped on the bottom and the warm air is on top. Another inversion occurs at the top of the troposphere at the tropopause, although I suppose that's kind of an isothermal layer. Um, temperature remains constant above it. It would technically be an inversion. Okay, to summarize, you've got temperature scales. Kelvin is Celsius plus 273. Fahrenheit is 1.8 times Celsius plus 32. You get the sun's heat heating up the earth and the amount depends on the insulation levels. Basically, it's how spread out the air, the column of sun rays are at the equator, it's quite a perfect circle, whereas up at the poles, it's more spread out and more of like an oval shape. And then if you throw in the Earth's tilt to the equation, that means that you get more in the summer months and in the winter months, you're gonna be spreading this area out even more. So you get less heating of the surface. The surface heats up depending on the type of material at the surface. Water doesn't heat up that much. It doesn't change that much in temperature um, throughout the day, um, mainly because it's a lot of the light is reflected off, a lot of the UV rays are reflected off, and also a lot of it's used in evaporation. Similar thing happens with snow. You get a lot reflected off and also get some used to melt and evaporate the snow. Vegetation, forests and stuff are generally quite good absorbing heat because they use a lot of the UV rays to um, photosynthesize their food. And then even better than that would be sand, rock, hard materials. They're just very good at heating up and radiating out heat. And then the next step up from that would be cities. They're basically sand and rocks, but there's, they're in 3D space. They're getting up taller. So the sun, the heat that radiates off the cities can bounce around in the streets and alleys and avenues and stuff. Once the surface has been heated up, depending on the material, it will then heat up the air around it in a few different ways. First, the conduction, that's contact. That's just a very small layer of air which is in contact with the surface. Then you get convection, which is when the air reduces in density because it's been heated up and expands. That air then rises up and spreads its heat to the surrounding air. When you've got local winds, that'll mix it a bit more um, through turbulence heating. When the air rises up enough, it will condense and form clouds. And in this process, it releases off latent heat. If we get a weather system coming in or a wind blowing in from somewhere hotter, we would call that advection heating. And once the surface has absorbed the shortwave radiation of the sun, it radiates out back some long wave heat energy, which is a bit um, cooler, not as hot. In terms of diurnal variation, um, basically we can say that it gets hottest 
after the point where the sun is highest in the sky because of these factors. These factors take a while to get in um, into motion, especially stuff like radiation. It's absorbed all that heat at 12 o'clock. It's maximum absorption at 12 o'clock and then it starts to release this heat out which heats up the air around it and that's what we're measuring when we're measuring temperatures. And you get a lower variation from day to night if you've got wind or clouds present because the clouds will reflect back off sun rays and keep the sun rays in and the wind will cause everything to mix together keeping it more um, harmonious. You get inversions sometimes in the atmosphere which are increases in temperature with altitude instead of reductions and you also get isothermal layers which is where the temperature stays the same. You get a few different types. The first is called uh, ground inversion. This is happening on cold, clear nights with very low wind and it basically results in fog or low clouds. You get subsidence inversions where air is forced down and as it forces down it heats up and it's falling down on top of air which has nowhere to go. So you've got a cold column and then you would have this warm air that's descended and heated up as it descended down and then you go back into a colder um, mass of air. And you get frontal inversions, which are the same sort of thing. Air rolls in and the warm air uh, sits on top of the colder air, which is already there. And then you would get an isothermal layer at the tropopause.